Hi, Tony from All The Remote Things back again, and I've got a fantastic one for you today. Have you ever wondered how mobiles could really benefit organisations a lot more than what we're using them for and how you could use the data? Well, that's what we're going to be discussing today. And to help us discuss that, I've got Tom Dempster with me. How are you today, Tom? Very well, thanks, Tony. Fantastic to have you on. So we're going to be talking about your company and, and, and your experience and some of the things that you're doing with a thing called Mobility View. But firstly, let's let's talk about you. Would you like to let everybody know where you come from and, and how you got to this point? Cheers. Well, you're talking to a guy that sculpted around a rugby field for 25 years, which probably says more about my personality than anything else. <laughs> uh, but I guess the journey uh, that I went on professionally um, I'll take it from a tech stack perspective, uh, semiconductors that go in the devices, operating systems that use those semiconductors, the devices that use the operating systems, the telecom operators that use the devices, a little bit of network infrastructure, and then value added services, uh, B2B and to consumer uh, through the global telco and smartphone channel. Brilliant, so you've had a long and varied background in, in mobility. But as, sure. we're, as we're saying, we're, we're, we're talking about mobility view today, and, and you and I sort of connected because I was I was uh, skulking around LinkedIn, as they say, <laughs> <laughs> and we had this serendipitous moment where we both realised we were working in the same space and had a chat, and, and then we got together and said, oh, well, we, we, we should let people know about this thing. So let's start with, with mobility view, which is really starting to think about using your mobile smart devices and turning them into a strategic asset for your organization. Let's, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what mobility view really is. Sure. So <clears throat> when we thought about smartphones, I won't bother with feature phones. Uh, when we thought about smartphones, they've been historically viewed as really a function of that great Canadian former company called BlackBerry. You know, Blackberries for those for those that are a little bit older, like you and I, we remember it as the Crackberry. Um, the Crackberry, that's a that's a that's a blast from the past. Yes, it is a blast from the past, um, and it was given that name because you basically couldn't put the thing down. Uh, which all it means is that I'm dating myself to the 2000s, where essentially you had email in your pocket, and that was a complete game changer in terms of productivity. The idea that you could get your email wherever you were in your pocket, you know, no need to access your desktop, no need to access your laptop. Uh, and uh, it was insane. You know, they had one of the first global instant messenger platforms and the amount of work that you did, you know, was over the top. Uh, then something called the consumerization of IT started. And essentially what that was, was BlackBerry being kicked, kicked to the curb by Apple and uh, Google, uh, in particular Samsung, with their iOS and Android platforms. And you had uh, what we'll call enterprise-grade devices that were there to do uh, exclusively uh, things that would drive productivity, in part because the Blackberries, all you could do was email. There were no apps, yeah, yeah, correct. video yeah. games. Uh, there was no porn. Um, now you have these consumer looking devices that come in, which completely change the game. And what you had as a result is a very significant reduction in productivity. So it turns out that the vast majority of usage of a company provided phone or a personal phone that is used for business purposes, bring your own device, the vast majority of usage, in fact, is personal. By the two, like we've never done, we've never seen a situation where, on average, less than seventy percent of the usage and cost uh, in either of those scenarios is personal. And so, it was great for Apple. It was great for Samsung. Not so great for the employer. Right? You had this massive amount of distraction and all the things that you could do with that device that was in your pocket 24 7 and that had little uh, or anything to do with work and so now what organizations are trying to figure out is what is the role of a smartphone in the organization 
how do organizations make mobility ubiquitous, but also in a cost contained fashion? What are the labor laws and tax laws and implications as a result of that personal versus business and usage? And ultimately what's happening and what we're seeing is organizations are rethinking their historical business process of, you know, welcome to the company, it's your first day on the job, you go to your desk, there's the corporate laptop, and beside the corporate laptop is the corporate phone. You know, that trend was rapidly declining before the pandemic. Uh, well, yeah. now, now there's no desk to go to. Yeah. And if you were to look at uh, the results of Dell, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft in particular during the pandemic, their B2B side of the house tanked but their consumer side of the house went through the roof. And what the reason being is that employees, remote workers were buying their own IT assets, the consumerization of IT, and then using those IT assets, in this case, a smartphone, obviously for personal purposes, but also for business. And the challenge then becomes is, what is an organizational business process? How can we provide mobility, but in a cost contained fashion in the light of the usage dynamics? And then to your earlier question, there's incredible data opportunity around harnessing the data sets that these smartphones are generating to drive productivity, business process improvement, but in a fashion that protects the employee from a privacy perspective but also that is cost contained from an employer perspective. And so what Mobility View does is we are that neutral third party that allows an employee and an employer to share in the cost of mobility. And by sharing in the cost of mobility, you're no longer having to do a business phone and a personal phone, cost savings for both. You're sharing in the cost of that ridiculously expensive smartphone that's growing at 10, 20% yeah. annualized yeah. notes. Yeah. And uh, what we're now seeing across the world, I can't speak Australia, but across the world, you're starting to see double digit price hikes in the rate plan because of the impact of inflation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty standard right, right, right across the, the spectrum of the world. And as you said, exponential increase in the cost of the actual physical phone itself. It's, I mean, it's crazy. If you think about your typical corporate uh, provided laptop, probably in the neighborhood of, in USD terms, 400 to no more than $650 USD. Uh, you know, a corporate grade uh, entry level iOS device is a thousand, maybe up to 1400 USD. Same thing for Samsung. So it's 50 to 100% greater in cost, yet the vast majority of the usage is personal. So, you know, what happens, the pandemic hits, everybody goes remote. And we foresaw the acceleration of the consumerization of IT trend. Um, we didn't foresee the pandemic. Uh, if you were to read the abstract of our patent filings in 84 countries back in 2013, your jaw would drop because what we spoke about was the evolution of consumerization of IT, bring your own device trend, bring your own PC trend, bring your own software trend. And then as a result of the pandemic, uh, folks, you heard it, heard it here first, BYOE, bring your own everything. Mm, yeah. Right? And so if we think about, again, historic legacy business process, you know, your employer provided a desk, provided a chair, it provided the square footage in their office, it provided the printer, it provided the ink to the printer, provided a photocopier, it provided the heating uh, and electricity to the office, it provided the office supplies. Now, employees are expected to provide all of that, and then the question becomes, you know, how do you handle reimbursement? And what we do is the, we do this, the smartphone reimbursement, because smartphones are ubiquitous. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing that you, you, you've jumped into because on this cast, I've, I've talked to a number of organisations now 
um, you know, that have started to look at how they how they do this, exactly what you're talking about, because, you know, everyone went home and went home in the pandemic and we, we got them on benches, we got them working and, and then leaders started working. But the reality is organisations have all sort of, they've managed to reduce costs by getting rid of uh, bricks and mortar Mm -hmm. then you're then you then your people are taking a hit you know you, they have to pay all those things that you're talking about and there's some of the organizations that are doing this really well now they you know they offer stipends for for building the offices and doing that thing but i think in in the the mobility piece i don't think too many have, have tackled that um talk to me a little bit about how you do that i think that's the the thing that i, I get the idea and i'm sure people listening to this get the connective idea of how that work or, or, or what that is but it's more about how does that actually work? So I'll, I'll have some fun uh, in the way that I answer. Um, when the uh, idea came to me, obviously we're gonna do some market research. Um, there are approximately in Western Europe and North America, 550 million employees that carry smartphones. That's uh, a lot of different scenarios you gotta handle. Those 550 million employees are employed by 47.1 million employers, broadest sense, private sector, public sector, NGO. So problem set number one is every one of the 47.1 million employers will have their unique business logic for their organization as to what is business or personal. A simple example is company A is a Microsoft shop, Company B is a Google shop. So Microsoft Office versus Google Docs. Yeah. So you, you've got to have a solution that can handle those 47.1 million variants. And, 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 and forgive me for not including Australia and, and your part of the world in that math, but obviously it's even larger when you do. And then problem set number two, every one of those employees that belongs to the same organization will randomly and uniquely use their smartphone every month. So how, how do you how do you handle that degree of randomness even when they work at the same company? Yeah, yeah. Problem set number three, if you believe in the whole consumerization of IT and you've experienced BYOD already, those employees <clears throat> might be provided a company device. The company might be uh, have a sourcing process where they source from multiple telecom operators, right? Vodafone in Australia, Telstra in Australia, or for your US audience, Verizon or AT&T in the States. Um, but then you also could have a contingent of employees that are bring your own device where they're bringing their own phone and they're bringing their own SIM card. So you have to have a solution now that's going to support a corporate provided scenario and a BYOD scenario. And then the fourth factor is if you, have that environment, you then have to support all of the telecom operators, meaning that your solution has to work in a way that doesn't have any dependency on whomever the telco provider is. And so it turns out this, this is not an easy problem to solve. <laughs> Obviously, yes. Um, and uh, because of that technical background I described earlier, I had this problem in 2008 eight when I was running all over Europe as a consultant working remotely uh, and I've been working remote since really uh, 1998 um, and my average bill uh, back when I was living in the Netherlands and Switzerland was about 5,000 euros a month um, and I was having to split it across multiple clients because I was on time and materials and it was taking me about three days to go through the very detailed, uh, very fine print of the call logs and would get to the data logs or the, would get to the data and you couldn't do it. And so because I had this technical experience, was able to figure it out. And to answer your question, essentially what we're able to do is we're able to gather big data from the device, specifically the call logs, the SMS logs, the data logs. We're able then to transmit them up into our cloud environment. We apply machine learning against the data sets based on the unique rules that their employer has. The tool then has the opportunity as well to learn directly from the employee. So the employee can teach the tool. And once taught, we'll never have to teach it again. 
And essentially with all of this ML, when you have enough users, AI is just ML at scale. I'm oversimplifying it. So the, the beauty of this solution is before the employee ever experiences mobility view, there is a set of business logic that is programmed. And so the moment they experience mobility view, when their employer provides mobility view to them, the reaction is always the same. How the heck did you know? How did you know that this phone number, this contact, this particular app, it's all pre-programmed. I don't have to do anything. Well, there'll be a couple of occasions where, you know, if you get a telemarketing call from India spoofing a local number, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to know, but you can teach, you can teach the tool to say that's a spam caller. And so it's all ML, it's all automation, it's all cloud-based. And what's beautiful is um, because we recognize this trend so early, uh, reflected in our patent filings in July of 2013, before we built a single line of code, we ate our own dog food. So if we believe in the consumerization of IT, which is essentially the downloading of traditional employee IT costs to the em employer IT costs to the employee, then before we built a single line of code, we had to build the solution, not from the perspective of the employer, but rather from the perspective of the employee. And therefore our approach to personal privacy is way ahead of GDPR and is better than the most strictest privacy laws in the world. And Tony, so I'm going to ask you a very long-winded question. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> when in the history of a corporate provided IT asset, smartphone or PC, has the employee had the ability to control the information disclosure around the use of that employer provided IT asset back to their employer? You know, pretty much never. And that was it. It was a. It's a great question because you flipped it on me because that was pretty much where I was going to go. The next next breath was to ask you, okay, oh, I get this, and and having talked to you, I got it. And then one of the questions that I had was, okay, security, privacy are going to be a big thing. Yeah, um, how are people taking to this? How is how is that dealt with? But you're answering that for me <laughs> as we speak. Well, what what's amazing is. If we assume, and I don't want to offend any privacy czars out there, that the, the European Union, uh, Germany in particular, Switzerland as well, obviously, for obvious reasons, are way out ahead of everybody else, right? And everybody's playing catch up. And GDPD, GDPR, GPDR, I always confuse the two. Um, what's amazing is when it's a company provided IT asset, under GDPR or GPDR rules, there's no right to privacy. With our tool, if it is a company provided phone and plan, with our tool deployed, we put the employee in control. The employee will make the determination as to what is business or personal. And the employer will only ever be, be able to see those things that the employee deems to be business, they can never see the personal usage, which means our approach to personal privacy is better than GDPR. Which is great. So, but let me ask you a question against that. Does then the, the employer have the opportunity then to go, okay, that doesn't look like a personal, that doesn't look like a business to me and, and buck the system. Is there a mechanism built into that? Right. Or is that a conversation so, and forwards or et cetera? So um, we, we employees have been filing expenses <laughs> in some form of expense report for centuries. Creating, so, account, creative accounting, we call that, Tom. <laughs> exactly. And so <laughs> there, is a there is a historic consequence should any employee fudge their expense report. Mm. So in that particular situation, say you elect to deem a phone call to mom and dad <laughs> yeah. to be business. Well, because you said it's business, you're disclosing that in all its glory. <laughs> You've made the decision to disclose it. You're accountable for disclosing it. And, you know, let's hope that in fact, this is a legitimate call to mom and dad, maybe because you were traveling for work purposes and the company policy says if you're traveling for work purposes 
then calls back to the family, will happily pick up the the roaming and 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 international calling for that. Brilliant. <clears throat> so so that struck me because because the current the current suite of you know BYID and etc. <clears throat> that usually uses like a certificate and and you do as you said you 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 basically turn your device over right by by allowing that that certificate on your device you then allow them to mm -hmm. control your device et cetera et cetera and so I can see how you've swapped that back across now the question I have to ask yeah. in the BYD world and, and yeah. I have a pretty a long background within mobile devices and stuff as well. And, and one of the things that it it does do is if the phone is compromised, then the organization is able to wipe data, et cetera. How does that work with this particular situation? So um, what you're describing is mobile device management, enterprise mobility management, mobile application management, you know, a bunch of a bunch of three letter acronym <laughs> under under the umbrella of security. Yeah, we like we, we like our acronyms in IT. <laughs> we do in the industry. So um, I'm going to betray an industry secret. At a touch of a button, an IT administrator when MDM, MAM, or MIM is, or EMM is deployed, at a touch of a button, an IT administrator can see everything that's going on your phone. Yeah. Even when it's your own phone and SIM. Yeah. Nobody knows that. And there are suspicions, right? And this is one of the reasons why the whole security piece really isn't going to work in around in this in the way that they people would hope in around the consumerization of IT because you haven't provided the carrot you provided a stick and so we are that carrot so unlike those solution providers because we built this from the perspective of the employee not the employer security is from the built from the perspective of the employer we don't have anything to do with security and so unfortunately as evidenced by the great Canadian tech darling that spiraled to its death, a movie has now been released on that story. The whole security space has been completely commoditized and there's no money in it. And you can now get EMM solutions for anywhere from one to $4 a month. Yeah. Yeah. You do it as a bolt on to Office 365. And so we're the perfect complement in a uh, security applied to a BYOD uh, phone, because the only way that you can encourage the employee to put that stuff on their personal phone and plan is the carrot of reimbursement. So the topic that you brought up about stipends, a lot of organizations have attempted to provide a stipend, but the problem is that a stipend globally is a taxable benefit, right? And so if we think that depending upon the country that you're in, the rate plan can be less expensive than the monthly cost of the hardware financed over 24 months. If we allow for a day of roaming, a bit of long distance international calling, sales taxes, when you add up the TCO, the smartphone, the rate plan, a little bit of roaming, sales taxes, a little bit of uh, international calling, you're conservatively, if you have any type of high-end smartphone, well over $110, $130 a month. So if you're an employer and you use the employer incurring those costs on an after-tax basis, so if the employer wants to do the enlightened thing and treat their employees fairly, a $100 per month stipend, let's assume that your all-in cost is also $100, bucks, well, you're only actually getting 60 because of the tax implication. So in order to actually pay for that personal phone and plan in a stipend, you're actually going to have to gross the stipend up by the marginal tax bracket of your employee to get them that tax-free cash to fund the after-tax expense. And what we're saying is forget the stipend, right? We're in a highly inflationary time. We're about to go into a global recession. Who knows how severe this is? You've touched on the fact that people or companies are dumping commercial real estate like crazy to save money. What companies are realizing is, hold on, 
during the pandemic, my employees were the opposite of mobile. You couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. Lockdown, yeah. Yeah. Sure, right? Sure. Very so true. basically, my employees who were incredibly productive and our profits were never greater during the pandemic were in their own homes 22 hours a day. What did we do? Well, we equipped their laptops, whether they were corporate laptops or employee laptops, with the ability to do a Zoom call like we're doing right now, the ability to do Teams, the ability to do voice calls. They started to realize, hey, hold on. Those corporate provided phones, those mobile smartphones, our, our employees are no longer mobile. Why are we providing them? And so in a, what also happened is companies were looking for ways to reduce costs, especially during the beginning of the pandemic, because they had no, we all had no idea what was going to occur. So what you saw was a, before the pandemic, the whole BYOD trend was accelerating. During the pandemic, because so many B2B businesses folded, particularly small businesses, and then the big businesses had hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, unbudgeted CapEx to deploy IT resources remotely. They were looking for any ways to cut costs. What, what happened is the smartphone costs got cut. On the auspices, they're not mobile. You don't need a smartphone. Now, what the unintended consequence of this is employees were still using their smartphones, right? So they basically started doing calls and getting their email on their phones. They were reading the email from the couch, whatever the case might be. And what was interesting was, and we predicted this very early, something very interesting occurred in California in 20, August of 2014 or 2015. So if people want to Google the California ruling cell phones, the Supreme Court of California weighed in and said that if you're an employer and you want to use the tools of trade that your employee brings, in this case, a smartphone, their own smartphone, you, the employer, have to reimburse them. And we, when we saw this in California in 2014 or 2015, we said this goes nationally in the United States and it goes global. And sure enough, that's happened. Yeah. You've now in a situation where 24 U.S. states representing 170 million Americans have now mandated that if you are working from home and you're using your personal smartphone and plan for business purposes, you must be reimbursed. And we're now starting to see the Department of Labor actually go after companies for the failure to reimburse. And bizarrely, class action lawsuits on the topic are through the roof. The LA Times last year, March, April, wrote an expose naming and shaming 10 of the largest private sector employers in the United States who had class action lawsuits against them by the employees for the failure to reimburse for smartphones. And then what was more interesting, Bloomberg in June of last year called out a small little company called Amazon <laughs> who had a class action lawsuit against them. So, yeah. so what's it's happening is companies don't have this thing figured out. Yeah. And we just happen to be, you know, right place, right time. Yeah, it, it strikes me that, that that's what I was going to say. It strikes me is that uh, the, the the companies are grappling with this, and I think there's another string to that bow too. <clears throat> had a, you know, had a, a cast here just recently with a digital, what we call digital nomad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's a, the, the the next thing as well is that people are working from anywhere, <clears throat> and so how does that work? Does this work in, in, in that instance where you're working in multiple countries and multiple different places and traversing those types of things? So um, if you go back to the complexity of the problem that we're trying to solve, and I outlined all those various steps, what you've just described is that last step. The solution has to be over the top or completely agnostic to the telecom provider that you happen to be using at the time. And there are two scenarios. There's a roaming scenario, right? So there you are in Australia. You have a, you're a consultant. You have to fly to New Zealand to do a project. 
well, you've got a local SIM, but you're actually roaming on Vodafone New Zealand, right? So the solution has to work to handle roaming, which we do. Um, then another scenario is, okay, um, my company is smart. They realized we got all these roaming costs. They told me as soon as I land in the airport, go get a local SIM, swap my local, my, my domestic SIM, or now my New Zealand temporary SIM, and that way I'll cut costs. Well, we have to support that scenario as well. So to answer your question, um, in the area of uh, in the area of work from anywhere or and work from remote, I call WFR and WFA uh, cross bar cross border, right? To distinguish it from work from home. So yeah, if you're a digital nomad. In particular, if you're going to hang out in some of these third world countries, because of the cost of living and arbitraging, you know, getting paid in USDs, but living, say, in uh, Thailand on the beach, it's not a bad arbitrage play. The challenge, of course, is uh, you're not getting world class connectivity. And in local currency, it can be actually ridiculously expensive. Yeah, very, very. So, yeah. yes, we will support both scenarios. That's, that's brilliant. So I, I guess yeah, I have one, one, one sort of last question because we are coming close to our time, but I really want to sure. um, And so so you touched on it, the big data, data-driven decision thing. So yeah. this enables the organisational construct then to look at where where the, where the, where the time is being spent or, or, or how do they use that data, I guess, is the question. For sure. You. So um, we have an NDA, so I'll protect the, the names to protect the innocent, we're guilty. <laughs> Let me give you an idea of the scale of the savings. True story. Uh, we cold called a CEO. This company had at least 100,000 employees. Based on our math, citing very credible industry reports, maybe they even wrote one or two of them that we were citing back to them. We promised the CEO we'd save them 150 million USD over five years. They ran a global trial. They did the math. It turned out that the math, we would save them for their 100,000 phones in excess of 340 million USD yeah. over five yeah. years or, or in excess of 70 million a year, approximately. What was interesting is that, that that individual would ultimately get fired for not cutting costs fast enough. And what was amazing was that the HR organization um, didn't like the business process change. And they were fighting for entitlement. They were fighting for the status quo at the time that the stock price hit 50 year all time lows. So unfortunately, when people are presented with the data, in this case, the analytics associated with the cost savings as one representation of the data, it can create a very uncomfortable scenario for those people that are looking to maintain the status quo. Um, and what we're saying to organizations, if you can't change something as simple as your cell phone policy, we're the canary in the coal mine. Yeah. If you can't change your cell phone policy, good luck handling all the other changes that are going to be forced upon you. Yeah, this is so, so, you know, to all, to all the CEOs out there in your network, we would say, you want to run a little experiment? Give me a call. We'll see what the organizational reaction is to changing something as simple as a smartphone policy as a proxy for bigger policy changes. It's and it's all about data-driven decision-making. It's a, it's a disruption indicator, isn't it, really? So, it is. So, yeah, it, it really harks on that, that data-driven decisioning. So I uh, thank you for answering that one. Look, we're, we're right at the close end of our time, and it's been fantastic to talk to you about this, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that um, people are going to have lots of questions. So if you've got any questions or comments, don't hesitate to throw them in the show notes down the bottom in the comments, and we'll be, I'm sure Tom will get back to you. Tom, how can people get in touch with you? How, how can they find out about Mobility View? Sure. Uh, website, www.mobilityview.com, all one word, no funky spelling. Uh, and uh, forgive me for being slightly old school. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not, I do have Twitter, but I don't use it. I'm not on Instagram. 
but I am on LinkedIn and we post regularly on LinkedIn, a lot of informative comment, uh, content there. So just look me up on LinkedIn, reach out to me. Uh, first name, Tom, T-H-O-M, last name, Damstra, D-A-M-S-T-R-A. Fantastic. But you do have a MySpace, right? <laughs> well, you know. If you have the fact that I recognize that, again, <laughs> demonstrates just how old we are, Tony. <laughs> very, very good indeed. All right. Look, fantastic to have you on all the remote things. If you're watching this, stuff, come and join us at our remoteaf.co community. All you do is go to remoteaf.co, click on the community button. We've got lots of people there. Excuse me, I'm cracking up today. It would be fantastic to have you join us. Tom, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on all the remote things today. Thank you so much. Pleasure.